Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here. And uh, we, you can continue talking after the service, and we encourage you to do so. Um, we uh, are going to continue in our series. We're in 1 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. We're going to be in chapter 7 today uh, as we look at 1 Corinthians. Just remember the theme of 1 Corinthians. It's the idea that the message of the cross, the idea that we die to ourselves, Christ died for us when we didn't deserve it, and he asks us if we know him to understand that the mission that he came to life, or came to the earth to do, to die and come back to life was to show what it would look like for us to live in this earth, to surrender our lives for his mission, knowing that we have an eternal home, that we have a firm relationship with him, so we don't need anything else to fill us up because we have him and he's provided us the body of Christ by which to be reminded of this fact of the cross. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, to those that think, wow, I, dying to yourself doesn't sound like the way to move forward, to get ahead in life, but it's God's power to us who are being saved. And Paul's writing, and he's like, the power of God comes through the idea of sacrifice. It's all the way through the entire Bible. And God calls us to embrace his sacrifice that he made on our behalf, that we can't sacrifice enough. That was the picture of the Old Testament. And so it had to be God's power that would save us. And so that's what Paul's kind of laid the foundation. We looked over the last few weeks about the cross. We looked at foolishness and understanding, wisdom, the idea of being a spiritual person, being found faithful, talking about having sincerity and truth. Last week, Paul kind of dove in after laying the foundation to some hard teaching of how to settle disputes in the church, and we looked at that. It's difficult when you read through 1 Corinthians. Paul doesn't hold back, um, and it's kind of one of those books that when you read it, you think to yourself, where are the churches like Paul's writing about? Like even our own church, as I read through 1 Corinthians, I'm like, we got some improvements to make. <laughs> like... I've got some improvements to make when I read through First Corinthians. I'm like, we're not there yet. Like, we, we, thankfully, we have God's grace that helps us and is patient with us. And, and I want you to hear that this morning. Because what we're going to go into this morning is the idea of single marriage. Single marriage. You might think, what, well, that single marriage? What? It doesn't, it, I put it up there to be that confusing on purpose. Because it's going to be that confusing when we go through it this morning. So, I'm putting it there, I'm putting it out there for you to just join with me in this idea of what does it mean single marriage? Because what Paul's going to get into is he talks about settling disputes. We talked about this last week, and Paul immediately knows, and we'll see in a moment, that the reason he had to address disputes is because they were asking, the church in Corinth had written him, and they were asking questions about relationships. Surprise! Specifically, they're asking questions about marriage and dating and who's the one and do I stay single or not? Surprise, it hasn't changed in thousands of years. Our hearts are still the same. Like, they're writing him and, and, and he covers the disputes because he recognizes that the reason they want to know about relationships, hear me out, is not because they really want God's view on relationships. They don't. They want to know how they can have the relationship the way they want it, the way they perceive it, the expectations they have, and the way they think it should happen. That's what Paul knows, and so he has to back up, and he gives some pretty hard teaching, and we're going to go into this this morning, and I can't even cover the width and the breadth of this, because this idea of marriage is the number one way that God uses to describe his relationship with us and his relationship to his, his people throughout all the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The idea of marriage is the symbol God uses as the picture of what it was going to look like to have an intimate relationship with him. And we have so messed it up and twisted it up, and we have since the beginning, since, since the fall of man, we've messed it up. But I want to encourage you this morning, what we're going to talk about is true. It's going to be hard, I promise. Some of you I know have passed, and you're hurting, and it's awful, and it's rough, and, and I, just, I just want you to pause, and we'll see as we get further down to the last part of the message, that there is still grace 
there's still a God who says, I love you. And the reason I know that is because we have a New Testament because he didn't stop the Old Testament and be, I'm done, and quit. He didn't do that. He continued to reach out to humanity, continued to reach out to his people to try to get their attention over how to live their lives in such a way that it was different than the world that everybody was clamoring for around them. And that's what I want to dive into. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, thank you for being honest with us, for for telling us how we've been created, for giving us your word, giving us teachers throughout history, prophets, prophets, priests, scribes, apostles that were willing to write the truth about you and write the truth about this issue that's caused more problems throughout human history than any other issue. It is the thing that has split nations apart and caused wars for generations. Because anytime we try to steal something that's yours, anytime we try to use it for ourselves, Then the enemy gets it and it becomes a war. And Lord, we're living in the midst of a war right now. Lord, we pray for those believers in Ukraine today who are worshiping you. They're singing in the subways. They're singing in their homes. They're meeting in bomb shelters. And they're sharing the gospel with their fellow Ukrainians to give hope in a situation that looks very hopeless. And Father, we thank you for how you have raised up a church there, that you've made a people for yourself And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be your people, be committed to you wholeheartedly as you've been committed to us as a bridegroom to his bride. We pray in your name. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 6, 19, this is where we left it last week, says this. And this is important. Before Paul goes into chapter 7, before he kind of dives into this, He ends with this on purpose. It's not like an accident. He says, don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. If you've come to know Jesus Christ, then the Bible says that you are indwelt or filled with the Spirit at the moment of salvation. When you pray to receive Christ, Christ says he comes in and he fills us up. And he begins to do his miraculous work of cleaning the temple, cleaning our heart, just like the Old Testament. And there's a process there. And he says, don't you know that you are God's? And then he goes on, that that it's, it's... Whom you have from God. In other words, this is a gift. You didn't earn this, right? And this is hard sometimes because you can look at married folk and be like, oh, the reason their life is so good is because they've earned it. They've they've done everything right. No, no, no. It's totally God's grace that married people have blessed lives, right? It is totally God's grace. And you might look at someone single and be married and be like, oh, I wish I could be single again. Like, oh, it'd be so nice. You know, and all these kids running around, you're like, oh, I remember when I didn't have all these beings bothering me. Like, you know, I, I mean, seriously. And so Paul's writing and he's saying, you've got, the first thing you've got to recognize is you're no longer the same. You've been completely and utterly transformed if you know Jesus Christ. And the evidence of that will be how you do relationships, how you feel about relationships, how you respond in relationships. That's going to be evidence. Then he says, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And that in your body is kind of a play on words there a little bit with Paul. Because he's writing to who? A specific person? He's writing to a church, a body of believers. So he's saying, don't you all know that you're not your own? You're a part of a heavenly family, a global body of Christ, and you've been called to a specific body, a local body, a single marriage? Right? Like we're all products of the global human, human marriage. That's how we got here, right? But we're, we're, we're specifically a part of a family that's recognized by the government and recognized. And so Paul's writing and he's saying, if you don't get this part, the rest of what we're going to do is going to seem pointless to you. It's going to seem foolish because the, what? Because it's foolish to those who are perishing. The cross The idea of dying to yourself, that you're not your own anymore, that you've been bought with a price, becomes a foreign concept. But when you understand this, then what happens is you begin to ask a single question. And that single question that's going to consume you is, how do I glorify God in this body? And the question that should consume a body of believers or a family or a marriage 
is what can we do to glorify God the most in our bodies? That is the ultimate question, the ultimate litmus test. And if we're not asking that question, if it's how can I get my body to feel better? How can I get my body to do the things I want it to do? How can I get, when it starts to focus there, instead of, nope, I've been bought with a price. This isn't my church, this isn't your church, this is God's church, and it's our church. Together. It, see, your, your whole, and if you don't get this part, then the rest of this is going to be all about, you ready for this? Manipulating relationships. Finding excuses. Trying to, instead of just embracing the truth, leaning into it, expecting the grace of God, which you needed to even have this relationship in the first place, you're going to push back from God and want nothing to do with it. And it's going to kill you literally inside. And so that's why Paul lays all this out because he's like, okay, we've got to, you've got to understand this because what I'm getting ready to dive into is not going to be easy. Jesus said this. He said, neither should you swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but your word, yes be yes, and your no be no, anything more than this is from the evil one. When you forget that you've been bought with a price and you want to glorify God in your body, then you stop keeping your commitments because, well, it's hard to keep that commitment, so I'm not going to do it so I can get what I want, so I can feel what I want. It's just, it, does God forgive that? Yes, praise the Lord, because I'd be in trouble if he didn't. But you can't get around it. And so this idea of single marriage, that that God said, I'm going to create a single marriage, a people for myself, a single marriage that is mine, and then I'm going to have these other covenants or relationships that are going to be connected, is exactly what Paul's trying to lay out. We go on in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, let's dive in, says this, now in response to the matters you wrote about, there it is, it's good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Paul has spent six chapters not answering any of their questions. (laughs) Think about that, you're in a family. My kids understand this completely, because in my house, they know that if you ask a question, you just don't get an answer, You, you you get an explanation, Right? Like, let's back it up and let's talk about why you asked that question. And let's talk about why the answer, why your question is probably twisted. And we need to talk about how we even got to that question before I can answer your question. And then it's like, I don't even want to ask questions. Forget it. Right? Same with Paul. Paul has spent six chapters saying, I've got to lay a foundation because the questions you're asking, I see right through them. The questions that you're asking are about you wanting to be happy, about you wanting to manipulate the church for your benefit, about you wanting God to fix everything in your life instead of picking up your cross because, oh, dying to myself would be foolish. So Paul lays six chapters of foundation and now he's like, okay, now I'm ready to talk to you about your questions. And he says, it's good for a man not to have relations with a woman. So they wrote him a question saying, you ready for this? Now that we're in Christ, now that we're a heavenly family, now that this idea of Christ is the bridegroom, we're the bride and we're married, should we just not do marriage anymore? Like, like, should that just not be a thing anymore? Like, we're just all one in Jesus and we're all just good, you know? And so nobody touch each other, nobody have sex, no more kids are born, we just are going to wait for Jesus to come back. Single, our whole lives. Like, amen. And that's the spiritual thing to do. Like, they are asking these questions, and the reason they're asking them is because they live in a culture that is nothing but sex. Remember, their culture in Corinth is the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. It is all sex. The entire culture is all about sex. This culture had women at the top of the food chain getting whatever they wanted from the men around them through prostitution and manipulation. It's the way it was. It's the way it was done. Women would get pregnant. They couldn't do abortions. So when women would get pregnant in the Roman Empire and they didn't want a child, they just leave it out in the cold. They take it out in the woods. Christians were known for going and finding those babies and bringing them and raising them in their churches. So they're asking, should, 
Can we just not have this sex thing? Because we're, we're tired of rescuing babies out of the woods that people have just left there. Because these prostitutes will have these children and throw them out. And then we, we're, can we just tell people, stop it? There's no more sex. No more marriage. That'd be easier. And so Paul understands that they have a problem in their theology. They have a broken mentality of the purpose of marriage and what God wants. In Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image. That's a problem for many people that are Hebrews or Jews. Because God uses a plural form of himself. So if he's a monotheistic God, why does he say let us make man in our image? Because it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a trinity. And so he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. A family represented. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on, he says, they will rule. God says, we're actually going to give them the authority to make decisions and to rule. And to rule means there is authority and there's a hierarchy. Because you can't rule if everybody's equal and can do whatever they want. That's not rule. And so he says, he created him, Adam, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Right? It's your job to fill it. Make people. (laughs) Lots of people. That's how I'm going to bring new souls into the world. So make them. I mean, that's what he says. And he looks and he says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So yes, it's it's good to not have relations with a woman based on their questions. Like, yeah, I get it. It's It's good to not just use people and sleep with each other and do what you want. Or, but then he goes. But but God, on the other hand, says, "Then the Lord said, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. I will make a helper for him, his helpmate. See, God actually designed in Adam something missing on purpose, and that was good." He designed in him a need to see that he needed something else than just himself. Him and Jesus weren't enough. Him and God weren't enough, that there was a bigger picture, a bigger thing God was doing. It's the same with us. We come to know Christ, and it's that intimate me and Jesus moment, and then Jesus looks at you and says, hey, you just joined a family. Let's meet some of them. And you're like, oh, I might have rethought this had you told me about the family first. Right? And that's why a lot of people don't commit their lives to Christ, because they've seen God's family and they're like, I want nothing to do with that. That's the most screwed up family I've ever seen. But they don't understand that in them is they're gonna fill that void with something if they don't fill it with God and fill it with his people and his church. And that's what Paul's getting ready to lay out specifically in marriage. And so he's looking and he's saying, you know. Again, they're saying, should we take a vow of celibacy in our culture? I mean, they're asking these hard questions in a culture that is just so sexually messed up. And Paul's finally saying, we've got to deal with this. He goes on, he says this. He said, yeah, it's good to not have relations, but because of sexual immorality is so common, each man should have his own wife. That's one wife, by the way, not multiple. And each woman should have her own husband, that's one, and a husband should fulfill his marital, marital responsibility to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. Now key, look at verse four. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Didn't we read a minute ago in the end of chapter six, Who has the rights to our bodies? It's not a trick question. Who has the rights to our bodies? God. If we know him, we've surrendered to him, then he has the right. He's bought the rights to us. Even if we say, I don't want your rights, guess what? God's still God and he still has rights to your body. Whether you like it or not. And so Paul's stating the obvious. He's just saying, look, you're... You don't have your body anyway, so why do you keep thinking it's yours? Stop it. Give it away. It's not your body. It's God's body. 
So what does God want to use your body for? Well, in Genesis, he wanted Adam and Eve to use their bodies to make little people. Let's use your bodies and make people. He still wants us to do that. He still says children are a blessing from the Lord. Do you realize that our birth rate in America is so low that we will not replace our population? We are not replacing the population that's dying. We are going to go as extinct as a nation. We need 2.5 children per woman to replace population. We're at 1.7 right now. In 2017, Japan made more adult diapers than baby diapers for the first time in their country's history. That's how selfish we've become. We have become so self-centered, so focused, even married people. We don't want to have children. We just want to enjoy our lives. What? That's not what God said in his word. Even if you're not able to have children, even if you don't have physical children, God calls us to make spiritual children, to invite people into our lives, to disciple them, to grow them up in the faith, to send them out. I got a call this week from someone, the two people we poured our life into. One guy called me. We had a great conversation and just prayed together. He was like, thank you so much for pouring into my life. It changed me. It's a spiritual son to me. Got another phone call from someone who was asking me to speak in an event. And they said, hey, we'd like for you to come speak. Oh, and by the way, I was talking to this guy. And he was just talking about how you'd poured your life in him. And you let him live in your house for a while. And how he's on mission now. And he's a missionary reaching foreign students here in the United States. And she was like, it was just so encouraging to hear him talk about your guys' relationship. And I just was so humbled by that. It wasn't a moment for me of like, oh yeah, I'm so awesome. I'm the best dad ever. No, it was a moment of like, me? That God would use this body? That we use this mess for his glory? How? Because I'm a disaster. And God's like, well, if you keep submitting it to me and giving it back to me, I'll use it. That's the process of repentance. There's kind of some main things that marriage does. It sanctifies us. Sanctification, recreation, procreation, and protection. Those are some basics. There might be some other things, but those are kind of some four main things. The first thing marriage does is it teaches us our desperate need for something outside of ourselves, i.e. the glory of God, God himself. That, that was Adam in, in Genesis. It was perfect for Adam to see there's something bigger that I need that God can only provide. That's called sanctification, becoming more like God, seeing things more God's way, acting. Recreation. Recreation is not just having fun. It's refreshment. The idea that this other person can refresh me when I'm down, can pick me up, that we, we encourage one another in the faith. The other one is Procreation. Be fruitful and multiply. And that last one is protection. We live in a world that's broken now. Oh, and by the way, in Genesis, it was Adam's job to protect Eve in a perfect world. Think about that for a minute. And he failed miserably. He literally stood there while a snake talked to his wife and was like, I want to see what happens when she eats this and see if she dies. Don't do that, husbands. If you're out hiking and your wife starts picking berries off a bush that you don't know if they're poisons or not, don't just stand there and be like, well, I'll see if she dies. Stop her. Call someone. Look it up on the internet. Ask somebody if we should be eating these berries. Don't lose her as the experiment. Don't do it. Bad idea. But that's what Adam did. Because deep in our hearts, if we're really honest, we can't stand to not have our will be done. And I'm just as wicked as you guys are. And I need people in my life, my wife and other people who look at me and say, you're trying to get your will done. What's God's will be done? He goes on and says this, do not deprive one another, he says, sexually, except when you agree for a time. In other words, now we know what Paul was even talking about when he said your body is your own, is he's actually inferring like, that's why you should give each other your body. Here it is. All of it. It's what you got. It's probably not the best I could do, but it's what's here today. Probably work out some more, it'd be better, right? So he says, he's like, don't deprive one another sexually except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
He's like, let's just be honest. The reason you probably got married or a big part of why you got married in the first place is because you were looking at boys and you were looking at girls. It's probably why you got married in the first place. Whew. Like you, you had an attraction that was there, right? And so he recognizes that that's in you, that, that that's a God-given thing that God gives, which we'll see in just a moment. And he says, look, it's not wrong to not use one another sexually for a time. Especially I, when I counsel couples, they're always amazed. I just talked with a couple this week. And they're always amazed when I look at them and I say, hey, look, while we're doing premarital counseling, I really need you to to, to shut off the physical aspects of your relationship if you haven't. Like for the next 10 weeks, you got to shut it down. And they're always like, what? I'm like, because you're going to have to learn to practice that. And it's way easier to practice it now than when you have to sleep with them in the same bed every night. And what do I mean by that? Ladies that have had children, how long does it take you before you're back in the mood again? How long is it before the doctor says you can even do it? Like they're looking at your husband go, no, 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 no. She's off limits till she heals. See, you've got to learn these skills. And he says there are times when you're going to not come together physically, and it's okay. It's, it's a natural thing. But if it keeps going, then there's probably something else at your heart or her heart or both of your hearts that's broken that needs to be addressed. There's something deep down that you need to ask, why can't I give myself to this man? Why don't I want to give myself to this woman? What's broken? You may need to invite help in to help you understand what that is. And you may need to take some time to pray. And get help praying about that. Can you imagine people praying for one another for their sex life in the church? Man, I would love that in our church. Paul's being blunt here. And then he says you should come back together and celebrate the fact that you were abstinent. Praise the Lord. He goes on and he says, look, you don't have the right to your body. It's a gift that you give. And when you withhold that gift, it says something about the other person. Just like if God withholds gifts from us, it says something about our heart. His desire is to want to bless us. And when God can't bless us and he's God, it means there's something he's not going to continue to enable or bless. And he's trying to get our attention. It's no different in marriage. It's that same kind of picture. I mean, and Satan's going to to attack this. Because Satan knows that this is where we're weak. And Paul's saying, look, I know you're struggling with this in the church and in the culture. This is one of the main tools that Satan uses to destroy people. It's one of the most frequent causes of disaster. Then he goes on, he says this, I say this, or I say the following as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were just like me. (laughs) Paul is single, right? Right? So Paul's laying out the marriage stuff, and he knows that they're hearing, oh my gosh, my body's not my own, but I'm so tired. My body's not my own, I mean, but I have to serve her, but I want what I want. Like, no, your body's not your own. You're together. You need to talk about how your body, now one, is going to do business. It's the same in the church. I don't get to stand in front of you and say, I'm the pastor, I tell all you what to do. We don't do that in this church very often, very little. We talk about it together, conversations Like, this is what we want to do. Here's how it's based in Scripture. We're long and patient as we make those decisions. Not just you do, we're doing this, you get on board. But like trying to equip the saints. And he says, look, I wish all people were just like me. There are some scholars who believe that Paul might have been married before. Now, I don't know that I believe that. I don't know that church history would fully agree with that. But there's been arguments throughout church history because there's a question of whether Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin or not. There's some scholars that believe he was. If he was a member of the Sanhedrin, you can't be a member of the Sanhedrin unless you were married. And so it could have been his wife died. It could have been she left him. Paul may be talking about widowing and he may be talking about a wife that, that leaves Because he's experienced it, not just because he's preaching to all of us how we should do life. Think about that for a minute when we go through the rest of this passage. Now, maybe Paul did stay celibate and chose not to join the Sanhedrin at the cost of his advancement. But I am telling you, if you knew Paul before he became a Christian, 
I'm guessing Paul didn't hold himself back. He was always trying to get more power, more influence, and get what he wanted. And so if he had to marry to get there, I'm sure he'd do it in a heartbeat. Until Jesus changed his life. He goes on and says this, but each has his own gift from God. One person in this way and another in that way. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with desire. That idea of burn with desire, we've always taken that, well, not always, but in the modern church, we've taken that to mean sexual, like burning, like I gotta, I gotta sleep with somebody. That is not what Paul's necessarily talking about here. Paul's talking about a deeper desire for intimacy, for relationship, right? It's that desire that Adam had in the Garden of Eden, that there's this desire, this burning desire to not be alone. I don't wanna be alone. So, do you know that there are people that really enjoy being alone? You're weird. You are just weird. I can't relate to you, except that Paul says I'm supposed to love you and relate to you. I, I don't get that. I, my skin crawls when I'm alone. Like, I'm like, I gotta like force myself to spend time in prayer and spend time alone with God because I just wanna be around people and things and stuff going on because that's just my personality. But there are people that God, have, he's actually designed them to love loneliness. Like, it, they, they enjoy being alone more than being with people. But that doesn't give them permission to just be alone all the time. That's not biblical either. But Paul says he has gifted us differently. Some of you in this room are going to be gifted to have like 10 or 15 children. Praise God for you. My wife was not gifted in that way. I would have liked for her to be gifted in that way. I'm still trying to adopt some kids every once in a while. And she's like, nope. I'm like, okay, well, maybe. Maybe. But now we're having grandkids, so now we're kind of, a, you know, that's a whole other thing. But anyway, like, Paul is saying, look, there's a sense of this is a gift. You know what else is a gift? Grace, breath, life, a job, health. They're all gifts. You don't earn them. You don't earn a wife. You don't earn a husband. You don't earn singleness. You just look at God and say, God, my body's yours, what do you want me to do with it? And he begins to show you the gifts that he has in front of you, and he begins to work through those, and if you just order your life with him, guess what? He will give you the gifts you need as you walk with him as you need them. You don't need to go searching for them. And we got people running around crazy trying to find the one. Oh, missed, that wasn't the one. Now this one wasn't the one. Now that one's not the one. Stop! Focus on Jesus. Surrender your life to him and see if he doesn't bring someone along with you. I heard someone say one time, a speaker was talking about marriage, and he said, you know, one of the best things you can do as a single person, and Paul's writing to those that are, that are single here. He's, he's, he's writing and he's saying, and to widows, and, and he's writing and he, he said, you know, if you're running your race with God, run your race. Run the race that God's called you to run, and then look around and see who's keeping up. And as you're running, look around and be like, oh, they're nice. Hey, let's run together. And you run, and there's another person that comes. There's like five of you running together. And you're like, oh, this is fun. And then one drops off, and you're like, oh, good job. You know, they're going on another track that God has them on their race. And then you run, and there's like, oh, another runs off. And there's like three of you left. I'm like, oh, hey. And you're running some more, and then there's just the two of you. And you're like, hey, there's just us. We keep running together. Would you like to run together a little more long term? I mean, that's how it's supposed to work. But instead, what we're doing is sitting in the stands, cheering for the one we want to get them to come to the stands. We want to like get them out of their race to be like, look at me, honey. Like we're the cheerleader on the sideline, you know, saying, look over here. You know, and the guy's going for a pass and he's like, oh, wham. I mean, just run the race God's called you to race and believe that he will give you the gifts that you need. And let me hear, listen, if you've used the gifts he's given you wrongly, you've broken those gifts, God is the one that can put things back together. You can trust him, but you've got to surrender and say, I'm no longer mine. I'm yours, God, for what you want. He goes on, he says, the, uh, First Timothy talks about widows this way, because as Paul's writing, he's saying to the unmarried and the widows, 
He's saying, hey, it's good for them if they remain. In other words, if they remain like I am, they're not going to be distracted. We'll see that in a minute. They'll be able to focus on Christ. First Timothy says this, do not rebuke an older man, but extort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and with all propriety, the younger women as sisters. We're all running the race with God. We're looking around. We know how to engage with one another, how to talk. And he says, support widows who are genuinely widows. You can underline that in your Bible, because we don't do this in our culture. Genuinely widows means they didn't murder their husbands, okay? Just saying. And, and that they, their husbands are dead. That that's a genuine widow. He says you should really look to help those people. Why? In this culture, men were being killed for their faith, and the church was full of widows. For men who said, I... Ukraine is going to be full of a lot of widows soon. A lot of widows. Because there are men who are saying, no, we're going to stand. And that's the same. And so Paul's saying, I get it, you Corinthians. You have all these widows because these men have stood against the things in culture and they've been beaten and they've been killed. And if they're genuine widows, the church should come alongside them and say, we want to encourage you and help you in any way we can. He says, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must learn to practice godliness towards their own family first and to repay their parents, for this pleases God. Paul says, but don't just jump on the widow bandwagon. You need to actually disciple the family to care for one another. And if a family, if there's a family that can care for that widow or those aging parents, don't throw that on the church. That's your responsibility. You take that on. In recognition of what? The fifth commandment, honor your mother and father. Honor those that are older than you as brothers and sisters, as mothers and fathers. It's just laying out the biblical command. Two people that do this great in our church are Jason and Joanna. Jason and Joanna provide incredible care for Betty and Anvi. It amazes me. I went and spent time with Betty and Anvi this past week, sat down with them, prayed with them, hung out with them. I love going to their house. It's so wonderful. And so we're there, and I'm just... Joanna calls while I'm there, and they can't get to the phone because it's too far away. I'm like, I got it. So I answer the phone. I'm like, hello? This is, uh, this is, I don't remember what I said, like the secretary of Betty and Anvi speaking, and Joanna's like, who is this? I'm like, it's Matt. She's like, oh, okay. Well, I'll let you talk to him. Just tell him I called. Okay, bye. But guys, that's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to, I sacrifice my life. I lay down my life in anticipation of caring for these widows who have served the church and their husbands have died serving the church. We should celebrate that. He goes on and he says, the real widow left alone has put her hope in God and continues night and day in her petitions and prayers. However, she who is self-indulgent is dead even where while she lives. Command this also, so they won't be blamed. He goes on to say, but if anyone does not provide for his own, that is his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Did you even know that Bible, that verse was in the Bible? We skip over it. Because why? Well, we got Social Security. My parents should have been smarter. They should have invested money right. Not my fault. We got to take a vacation. These are hard things. Paul's not p- pulling any punches here about how family and things should look based on how God treats us. And he looks and he says, no widow should be placed on the official support list until she is at least 60 years old and has been the wife of one husband. And is well known for good works. That is if she has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. Is there any widows that qualify for that in our culture today? I mean, that that just breaks my heart when I read that. I hope there are. I know of a few. Matter of fact, Eli shared in our small group last week of a widow. When they went into her home and they went through all of her stuff, Nothing but prayer journals for the saints of her church for decades. People weeping as the pastor read their name and her faithfulness to pray for them and serve them. 
She didn't even know if anyone would come to her funeral. There were over 350 people there. Guys, we got to live differently. It's got to look different. That's what Paul's writing, and he says, he goes on, he says, and is well known for good works, and he goes on, he says, but refuse to enroll younger widows. Look at this. For they're drawn away from Christ by desire. They want to marry. They're going to get lonely. (laughs) Old widows, number one, most old widows, no more sex. (laughs) I'm done. That's off the table. They've also been with a man for a very long time, and they're probably thinking to themselves, I remember when Paul said it was much better to be single. I'm there now. (laughs) I loved my husband. It was great. Oh, I just, this is nice, right? And he says, and they want to marry and therefore receive condemnation because they've renounced their original pledge. They're going to say, oh, I want to be a widow. Take care of me. Take care of me. And then they're going to have this desire to not be a widow anymore. And you're going to be like, hmm. You, you're yes, be yes, no, be no. We put you on the widow list. I, that's going to be hard. You're going to have to come before the church and repent and say, I'm sorry I was on the widow list. I repent. And we're going to have to like go through a process of what that looks like. At that time, they also learned to be idle. Going from house to house, they're not only idle, but they're also gossips and busybodies saying things they shouldn't say. How many more wives of LA TV shows do we need? I didn't write it. Paul did. There is a sense that when women are not married and there's not like responsibilities, and men can be the same way, don't get me wrong, they go blow stuff up though. They don't gossip, they just go blow stuff up and do crazy stuff, right? Like they do. It's just a different way it plays out. But he says, look, he looks and he says, they're going to want to marry and instead of being busy about a family and that desire to not be alone, that desire to give their life to someone, you know what they're going to do? They're going to become busybodies and they're going to mess everything up. They're going to cause fights and divisions. They're going to go around trying to fix everybody's problems instead of just fixing their own problem of loneliness and marriage. He goes on, he says, for some have already turned away to follow Satan. Or no, he says, therefore I want younger women to marry, have children, manage their households, and give the adversary no opportunity to accuse us. For some have already turned away to follow Satan. If any believing woman has widows in her family, she should help them. And the church should not be burdened so that it can help those who are genuinely widows, those who actually need help. Had a conversation yesterday, a show choir competition about the homeless and the frustration that this person was experiencing about trying to help homeless people. And I kind of walked him through how we look at things in our church. One of our FX distinctive talks will probably be on relationships. That'll probably be one of the things that, that we deal with. But I was telling him about how a pastor taught me how to kind of handle that well. And who do you support and how? And how do you make that determination? Paul's doing the same thing here. He says, look, you need to be sure of that. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 7.10. I command the Mary... Not I, but the Lord. Now pause. When Paul says, not I, but the Lord, people think, oh, well, Paul's saying this so we don't have to obey it. Paul's Paul's going off script here. You know, like, before he was talking from the Lord, but now he's gone off script. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's saying, what I'm getting ready to tell you is not something I, I'm not going to go back and grab scripture and be like, this is exactly what God says to you. What he's saying is, I'm now speaking apostolic. I write scripture. I'm not going to give you scripture because Paul's good about giving scripture. Jesus said, the Lord said, the Lord declared. He's like, no, no, no. In this instance, I'm declaring to you. I'm just going to say it out. He says, a wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to leave his wife. This is not to happen in the church, Paul says. And the reason he says this is because in the Old Testament, we see where there is dismissals of relationships. What Paul is saying is, look, under the Old Covenant, there were these reasons to get out. There were these reasons to escape. Under the New Covenant of the cross and you die to yourself, there's no room for escape if you truly believe the gospel. The New Covenant's way deeper than that. I mean, this would have been, now, does that mean if we mess it up, God's like, and that's why you're going to hell and I'm done with you? No. Otherwise, we'd all be go to hell. I mean, because we all are a mess. But Paul's like, I've got to tell you the truth. The best way to represent Christ is to not leave one another if you call yourselves Christians. Period. And he's going to qualify this in a moment. 
Malachi 2, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but Malachi 2 is all about the idea of God and marriage and marriage to his people. And he says in 2.11, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament before 400 years of silence. He says, for Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign God. In other words, Judah's looking for the wife he wants. He doesn't want to wait for the gift of God and the woman God wants him to give. He already has wives. He doesn't need to want another one. He keeps chasing another wife. And then he says, he goes on in verse 14 and says, you've acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and wife by covenant. He says, Judah, this is on you. It's on you as the man. You should have been leading your life differently. And then it says, and what does the one seek? And God says, look, the reason I'm so concerned about all this marriage stuff in Malachi 2, the reason I'm telling you that judgment is coming on you because of the way you handle relationships, God says, I seek godly offspring. I want kids that see the family of God lived out. That's what I want. And you guys keep making families for your benefit, not God's. And he's like, I just want kids to see people love each other and give their lives to one another like I, God, have given myself to you. In Matthew, Jesus was approached at one point, Matthew 19, 3. Some Pharisees approached him and they asked, or to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. He also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. In other words, it's a new body. It's a new unit. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us, the priests, to give divorce papers and to send her away? Oh, So you think you're so smart, Jesus, then then why did Moses allow it? Why did Moses allow this stuff to go on? Jesus' response, he told them, Moses permitted your divorce, or permitted you to divorce your wives or wives' husbands because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. And I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Remember, God divorced his people a few times. He gave them a certificate of the divorce in the Old Testament because they committed adultery against him. That's why God says that's a permissible offense because that, I did it. And so if it's not permissible to do it, then I'm in trouble because I, God did it. Now, did God go out and Marry a bunch of other people? No, he still loves his people. He still tries to reach them. He's still trying to reconcile with his people Israel. And in the final day, he will reconcile with them. He goes on and he says, and he marries another, he commits adultery. So he says, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. His disciples said to them, if the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, look, same thing the church in Corinth said. It's better not to marry then, isn't it, Paul? Now, you got to recognize, this is the great part about that statement. It's kind of funny. There's 12 disciples. Some of them were married. Some of them weren't. This little comment right here is beautiful because the single ones are like, and that's why we didn't marry, and we can follow you better than Peter can. It's exactly what's going on here. They are literally saying, that's why it's better not to marry, right, Jesus? Like, Peter, we got to keep going back to his mother-in-law's house and give her money and take care of her and stuff, right? And not me, because I'm single. It's just me and you, Jesus. He goes on, he says, but he told them, not everyone can accept this saying, but only the one it has been given to. It's a gift. Some are gifted to be single. Some are gifted to be married. It's a gift, and you embrace the gift. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. You know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is someone who doesn't have the right body parts. Their body parts are messed up. They can't reproduce sexually. That's a eunuch. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves that way because of the kingdom of heaven. Either physically did it, or they have chosen to say, I'm not going to use those parts because I want to serve God fully in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, let anyone accept this Who can? Well, if we've accepted Christ, then we can accept this. We should be able to. 1 Corinthians goes on to say in verse 
12, but I, not the Lord, say to the rest. So now Paul's speaking to the rest, right? He's like, I'm speaking specifically to this group, now I'm speaking to the rest. The rest being those people that aren't believers. Paul has been speaking to believers up until this point. Now Paul says, I need to speak to the rest of the question, the rest of what you've been asking. He says, not I, or, but, uh, but I, not the Lord. Again, Paul is not saying that this doesn't carry authority. He's not saying, well, I'm just speaking, so do whatever you want. He's saying, I am speaking into the new covenant now. I'm speaking on the basis of a relationship with Christ. This is different than the old covenant. So I'm, I'm explaining this to you. And he says, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she's willing to live with him, he must not leave her. If she's willing to live with him, that's abandonment. She won't abandon him. He goes on and says, also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he's willing to live with her, she must not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is set apart for God by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is set apart for God by the husband. That doesn't mean that they're saved through their spouse. It means literally the other person is helped sanctifying the relationship. That other person is helped sanctifying you. It's causing you to give more of your life to lost people who don't know God in your own family. That's sanctification. That's what Jesus did. He came and he gave his life to a bunch of people that wouldn't believe in him. He goes on and he says, Otherwise your children would become corrupt or be corrupt, but now they are set apart for God. Your children are watching. And when they watch someone who believes in the cross, when they watch someone who's willing to... to, to navigate the single marriage like God wants to, when they do that, these kids are watching and they're saying, oh, that's what Jesus looks like. That's what the gospel looks like. That's what it looks like to surrender your life to God. That's what it looks like to repent. That's what it's looked like to receive grace when you've messed up. Oh, that's what it looks like. And Paul says, if the unbeliever leaves, let them leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases And God has called you to live in peace. In other words, Paul says, there has to be a process of declaring the other person an unbeliever. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That there's got to come to a point where the person in the marriage and the church is willing to look and say, this person is an unbeliever, period. We don't do that anymore, which is why this is a mess. And we don't know how to obey Paul in these passages. It's a struggle for our church, just like it is for every other church. It's difficult to walk through this. Sometimes it can take months or years to walk through this process. It's a hard process. But he says, a brother or sister is not bound in some cases. God has called you to live at peace. In other words, don't tie them up and throw them in the bedroom and keep them there and slide food under the door to prove to them how much you love them in Jesus' name. That's not peaceful. That's not going to help. Don't enable them. Set them free. And say, you don't believe in Jesus. And I wish you did. I wish you believed in Christ. I wish you believed what he believed. But you just don't believe right now. And I hope it's not actually you don't believe and you're going to hell. I hope it's just you don't believe in our marriage right now and God's going to use this to turn you back. Paul goes on to say that very thing in the next passage. Look. For you, for you, wife, how do you know whether, your hus- whether you will save your husband? Or you, husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? You don't know. But you better follow the right process to humble them so they might be saved. And that's what Paul's laying out in this passage for us. In Ephesians, Paul talks about being imitators of God. He goes on to say, should it... Should sexual immorality or greed even be heard among you? Let no one deceive you. Pay careful attention then. How do you walk? Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will. Speaking, singing, giving thanks. And then he says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And right after he says that, Paul goes into the first place where it's the hardest to submit. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husbands is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now that as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. 
Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For one who he... For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. It's that togetherness again. He goes on and says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two will become one. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul says marriage is the picture of Christ and the church. To sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. It's just simple. And we fight this just like the Pharisees come unto de- Jesus. What about this, Jesus? What about that? We're going to test you with that. What does the Bible say? Let, let's do this. Let, let's try this. And if you screwed up and you haven't done this, let's try what the Bible says, which is to repent and ask forgiveness and get around the body of Christ and try to figure out how to reconcile and make this work. First Corinthians goes on, says, however, each one must live his life in the situation the Lord has assigned when God called him. This is why I command in all the churches. Was anyone already circumcised when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Ouch. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. Circumcision does not matter and uncircumcision does not matter, but keeping God's commands does matter. Each person should remain in the life situation in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? It should not be a concern to you then, Paul says. You read this and you go, so if I come to know Jesus single, then I can never be married? No. He's talking about your calling. You are called to do things all the time. He's saying this. Focus on the call of God on your life, run your race, and maybe God will call someone to run beside you, and he will let you know, I'm calling, and the other person will let you know, hey, God's calling, and the two of you will go, we got a calling. That's what this means. It's that simple. You just walk with God in the calling he has for you right now and trust him that he will bring good gifts, good things into your life, and he will call the things into your life, into existence that he wants you to have. And you do that. That's what Paul's talking about here. Quit trying to fix it. Well, I'm going to get circumcised. I'll be more spiritual. Oh, I'll get this and I'll be more spiritual. I'll do this. He's like, no. Then he goes on and he says, I'll, I'll get out of slavery and then I can serve God better. Maybe not. But if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity if you're enslaved. For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who is called as a freeman is Christ's slave. You Look, he goes back to what he said at the end of chapter 6. He's wrapping this whole thing back around to the cross. Because he says right here, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves to men. Quit looking for that person to fill your life because if that person becomes Jesus, you're going to be enslaved to them the rest of your life as a witness to Christ, possibly. Don't do that. That's what Judah did in Malachi. Don't do that. He looks and he says, you've been bought. Don't place yourself back in the slavery of the world. Brothers, each person should remain with God in what, look at what he says, in whatever situation he was called. What's your situation? Then remain in that until God calls you to something else. It's like being in a church. Remain in that church until God calls you away and then hopefully the church would look and go, God's calling you away. Let's celebrate that. Let's send you out. Praise God. That's how church should work. It should be mutually talking through those things and we're sending one another out. We're counseling with one another so that we Make the right decision that God wants for his people. He goes on and says this in verse 25. About virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I do give an opinion as one by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Therefore, I consider this to be good because of the present distress. He's talking about the present pressures of that society, of being married and sexual, all the stuff, this pressure, this present distress, or even the present distress of like Christ hasn't come back yet. He says, it's fine for a man to remain as he is. That's what he just got done saying. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Don't seek another one. (laughs) However, if you do get married, you have not sinned. 
He looks and he says, look, if you're thinking about this girl that's a virgin and or a guy that's a virgin, virgin being not being married. And by the way, when you come to know Christ, guess what? You're born again, which means what? You get a new virginity. Pretty amazing. That God restores back the things that were broken and beaten, and he, and he renews and he makes new. And so if you've messed up sexually in the past, God can restore you, I promise. And he wants to. He looks and he says, however, if you... Do get married, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. But such people will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. I love that. Paul's speaking about an opinion here. He's like, look, I get it. Like, you guys running, you're like, oh, you're cute. You're cute too. Oh, let's do this together. He's like, here's the deal. You were running like your race, but now they're going to like stop and eat a cheeseburger, and you're going to have to stop with them. You're like, dude, we don't need to be eating a cheeseburger right now. We're, we're trying to run a race. You're going to vomit in a little bit. And I'm going to have to help you clean it up. It's just going to, don't eat. Okay, just ate a cheeseburger. Okay. You ready to run now? Okay, let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to get down, pick it. Like, that's what, he says, look, I'm just, I'm just letting you know that you think that this is going to fix your problem. You think getting a wife, getting a husband, you think getting a virgin, you think getting all the right stuff is going to fix your problems. I promise you, it's going to give you more problems, which is great. Because it'll sanctify you and make you more like Jesus than you ever thought you could be. Praise God. That's what Paul's saying. He goes, but you don't see it that way. You see it as I'm going to get married. It's going to fix all these problems. He's like, no, it'll fix some things. And it's going to open up a bunch of other ones. And that's okay. Because God, what do you want? Do you want me to have more problems? I take them. I take them. You want me to have less problems? I'd like that. I'll take those too. He goes on and he says this. An unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Okay, he's supposed to be, but let's be honest. That's sometimes rare. But a married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, so that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. That would be nice if that were always true. Okay, then he goes on. He says, now I'm saying this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but because of what is proper so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. He's saying, look, I'm just telling you the truth about this stuff up front. You need to know what you're getting in on when you get in on marriage. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's good. It, it'll do all the four things I listed. It's great. But you need to be clear why you're getting in because if you're getting in for the wrong reasons, I promise you that's going to come back to bite you. You better be sure you're getting into this because it's the best way for you to be dedicated to the Lord and be called to his work or it's just going to be another distraction to keep you frustrated. He goes on and says, but if a man thinks he's acting inappropriately towards his virgin, if she is past marriageable age, and so it must be, he can do what he wants. He is not sinning. They can get married. In other words, if you're running a race together and you're like, oh, maybe we should just stay single, but you're hanging out together all the time. And everyone keeps asking you, are you a couple? You should probably stop that and figure out if you're a couple. Because people are confused and it's weird. Fix it. Right? Doesn't mean you can't be friends. Doesn't mean you can't hang out. I'm not saying that. But if it's constant and people think like, then you need to question like, why are we together? Maybe God has something here. He goes on he says, but he who stands firm in his heart, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and has decided in his heart to keep his own virginity, his own virgin, will do well. So then, he who marries his virgin does well. This is very confusing. Scholars have argued about this passage for a long time. Is it talking about a father and he had authority over his daughter and what that looks like? We're not sure, to be quite honest. But what Paul is laying out is he's saying, look, it's good to be a virgin, it's good to be single, and it's good to be married, if that's what God wants for you. It's pretty much that simple. Proverbs says this. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Well, I thought it was better to be single. Well, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So if anybody knew about wives and women, it's probably Solomon, right? He says, who can find a capable wife? She is far more precious than jewels. I wonder if Solomon never thought he found a capable wife, which is why he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. 
God says, look, marriage is a good thing, but it's not necessarily what God wants for everyone. Then in 1 Corinthians 7, but he who does not marry will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband is living, but if her husband dies, she's free to be married to anyone she wants. Only in the Lord. Underline that in your Bible. Only in the Lord means another believer. You are only to be married in the Lord. That means to another believer in the context of the body of Christ saying we approve of this. That's what it means to be married in the Lord. Look, you can go get married to the justice of the peace. That's fine. Go get married to the justice of the peace. The church doesn't have to bless that. He says, be married in the Lord, but she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion, Paul writes. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. He goes on, as we wrap up, I want to give two last passages to think about because as Paul writes this, and he lays this out. He's talking about singleness and marriage. And they're asking a question about being celibate. And he's saying, look, marriage, celibacy. You've got to remember, in Roman culture, not getting married was not a good thing. You wanted to be married. You wanted multiple marriages. You wanted to use those marriages to manipulate families and to gain power. That's what you wanted to use it for. So for Paul writing about celibacy, that is just as weird in this culture, especially in Jewish culture, as it is today. And so Paul's just saying, look, I get it. This celibacy thing isn't going to be for the majority of people, just so you know. And can I just tune in for a sec? Can I just tell you most of what we talk about as celibacy in our culture today, and especially in Christian cultures, is just single selfishness. I'll call it what it is. It is single selfishness. It is not women and men giving their lives to the local body, the church, giving their lives to the ministry of Christ. There's a few out there, don't get me wrong. The majority of singleness is, I want what's easy, I want what brings me pleasure, I don't want anybody to sanctify me, I don't want anybody in my life, I don't want any mess, I got my life figured out, and that's what we do for singleness, and that is not biblical. Paul makes that clear in this passage. Be very careful that you're walking with Christ and you have the help of the body of believers work through this process with you. Trust me, just ask somebody around you, do you think I could be single? They'll answer that for you pretty quickly. They'll say, by the power of God and the Holy Spirit, if he came down with angels, yes. Or they'll look at you and be like, uh, I don't, you're going to need somebody. As we wrap up, God has this as some encouragement. Remember, this is a picture of God having a single marriage to his people. God who could stay single as creator and never need any of us said, that's not how I'm going to do things. I'm going to create people with a choice and a free will and there's going to be a relationship and an exchange. In Hosea, it says, in that day, this is the Lord's declaration, you will call to me or you will call me my husband and no longer call me my Baal. That's my, my idol. There are a lot of marriages that it's idolatry. It's just idolatry. For I will remove the names of the idols from her mouth, and they will no longer be remembered by their names. God can heal the idolatry. He can forgive it. He can bring healing, hope. And he says, on that day I will make a covenant for them with the wild animals, the birds of the sky, the creatures that crawl on the ground. I will shatter the bow, the sword, the weapons of war, and the land, and will enable the people to rest securely. I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. And I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know me intimately, Yahweh. Wow. That's our God. He says, I'll remove all the idolatry and the mess and the pain. And I'll bring in healing, but you've got to die to yourself. You've got to pick up your cross. You, you've got to stop. This is beautiful. He is writing to his people who are in complete rebellion at this point. And he's like, at the end of the Bible, it says this. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give glory. Give him glory because the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has prepared Herself. I also saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. He won't abandon them. He won't cheat on them. He won't give up on them. He is going to be with us forever, he says. It's so beautiful. 
And he says, they will be his people. They will respond in kind. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues of destruction came and spoke with me, come. I want to show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. This angel has seven bowls of disaster. And that's not even the concern. The concern is, I want to show you the bride. I want to do, this is all going to pass away, but you've got to see the bride. Can I just tell you this morning that God has a hope for you? I know some of you are hurting. I know this is a hard message. But can I tell you, please lean into the church. Paul was written a letter and he's responding back to these Christians telling them, I want to help you. We want to help you. Are we good at this? Not necessarily. They weren't good at it either. It's hard to walk through this stuff with people. But I can promise you, we'll take you to Scripture. We'll do the best we can. We'll take you to Hosea and Revelation and give you the hope of surrendering your life to Christ and call you back into reconciliation in the relationships in your life so that God might be glorified through you so that you might come one day to the end of your life and see what God could only do in the mess. So I don't know where you are this morning, but I'm telling you right now, God wants you to hear this word from him and be singly married to him and to be in a single purpose of what his purpose for marriage is in the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word this morning. Lord, this is heavy. This is the thing that for all of human history has been a disaster. Men using women, women using men, children being torn apart and pitted against one another, men with multiple wives, their children fighting with one another and killing one another to gain power. Lord, this has been a disaster. And so if we've been a disaster, you haven't done away with humanity yet, so you're not done with us yet. And so, Father, I pray that this morning you'd bring hope in the midst of the mess that some kids have been through here in this place. I, think, I pray that you'd bring hope to those who maybe have caused the mess this morning. And they get serious about what it looks like to go back through these scriptures and surrender to you and pick up their cross and say, I'm I'm ready to surrender. I I pray that they would ask for help. And Lord, I pray that if anyone listening to this message online or in this room right now does not have a relationship with you, they've never said no to all the relationships of the world to finally say, I'm done chasing. I just want God. I want the marriage that will last forever. I pray today would be the day they do it. And they would know that you are the one that gives them the gift of grace, that gives them the gift of cleanliness, that gives them the gift of faithfulness, that wipes the tears away. They're not going to find that anywhere else in the world, only in you. And Lord, those that are single in this room, I pray that they would run in their call. They would be focused on being obedient to you and walking with you and just believing that you give good gifts to your children and they can trust you. And for those of us who are married, I pray that we would see that the marriages that we have are good gifts to us forcing us to trust. We thank you in your name. Amen.